families, and special guests. Welcome. My name is Kayla Teeters, and I would like to welcome you all to the 2018 baccalaureate service. Congratulations in completing this huge milestone in your life. It seems like just yesterday, we were all freshmen looking up at the seniors wanting just to be just like them, old and not awkward. This year came up on us, and we've gotten to enjoy many bittersweet laughs in Fairmont. Now we are here at the end, and it seems unreal and a bit scary. So many things will be different for us in our day-to-day -day lives. Yet as we are entering these next steps in our lives, have ease in your heart and mind, knowing the Lord has a plan for you to fulfill your heart's desire and that he is always with you. Looking back over the past four years, I can honestly say I couldn't have asked to graduate with a better class. Each of you have accomplished graduation, and now that you have done that, go into the future with confidence, knowing that you can do anything that you set your mind to. I'm very excited for this next chapter in our lives. I wish you all good luck and everything that you choose to pursue. Thank you and congratulations again. Now I'd like to welcome Mr. Rue up to the stage. The Lord be with you. That's an old Lutheran thing. Uh, when I say the Lord be with you, you can say, and also with you, the Lord be with you. Awesome. Thank you and good afternoon. It's awesome for my wife, Sheila, and me to be welcomed back to the city that uh, was basically my home away from home for 17 years. Kettering embraced my sometimes, or some would say all the time, over the top enthusiasm as much as I embraced its dedication to a culture of excellence. It's an honor to be asked to speak and pray for the graduating class of 2018 and their parents and families. This day seems like an eternity away from August 11th, 2011. That was a Thursday night, five days before the first day of school for about 500 sixth graders from Van Buren and KMS and many of you who went to middle school outside of Kettering. That was always one of our favorite events of the year, an auditorium packed full of newbies so anxious and excited and uptight, and that was just the parents. <laughs> the goal of our time together then, and in all the other middle schools, was to have everyone take a deep breath. Remember Van Buren, folks? I actually had you take a deep breath and hold it. And then we went on to encourage the kids to energetically get the most out of your middle school experience, because before you knew it, you'd be graduating from high school. Also to be part of the school family where we tolerate each other's differences and celebrate our collective successes. And to be difference makers at school and in public representing Kettering and your parents and your grandparents positively wherever you go. So fast forwarding 2,088 days later, my brief message is pretty much the same. But since I'm talking from the pulpit instead of a podium, I can give credit where credit is due and point this same to-do list towards our relationship with Jesus Christ. So graduates, I'm gonna ask you to do the impossible and recognize the importance of this day and your upcoming gradu gradu graduation ceremony. Recognize the importance while you're in this moment. So once again, I'm gonna ask everyone to take a deep breath and hold it and let that out. And now think about the impact your lives will make and how that will all be shaped based on what you do in the next few months and few years. So you're maturely reflecting on what you will do to live a life that matters. And consider that ultimately our lives, and that includes the adults in the room as well as the youth, consider that ultimately our lives will matter most if we make an impact for Christ's sake and not our own sake. So some practical advice today, it mirrors what I talked about almost six years ago. I just get to put Jesus in the middle of it this time. So to live a life that matters, we must first live with passion. Jesus said in the book of John, chapter 10, verse 10, I came so that they may have life and have it abundantly. Now I know that the full life Jesus was talking about wasn't necessarily about zip lining or white water rafting or bungee jumping or whatever. But I think fully realized salvation by our belief in Jesus includes embracing the everyday awesomeness of this world and whatever that means to you or to you or to you. 
It's living life with passion, and it's a vital part of living a life that matters. Secondly, live life with humility. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul writes that even though Jesus was God's very son, Jesus made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, and he humbles himself even unto death on a cross. If this kind of humility was good enough for Jesus, it should be good enough for us. I challenge you to put others' interests before your own, to be a servant, to do for others what no one else will, take up for the weak and the outcast, in a world whose mantra is, me first, you can never underestimate the impact that your humility can make on the world around you. It is not without reason that Jesus said the first will be last and the last will be first. And finally, live life with purpose. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, if anyone is in Christ, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. We can't walk around living the life of a dead person. Our old life with all our selfish desires and trivial concerns is gone. Our new life is a life of meaning, a life of grace, and a life of purpose. And I believe that purpose can be summed up in one verse, Matthew 5, 17. Let your light so shine before others that they would see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. A challenge to all of us today and in our futures is to let our lives be such a radiant light that people see us and know we're different, and know the difference in us is Jesus Christ, and that difference draws them to the Lord. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for this special day, this opportunity to gather in your house, to recognize and hopefully inspire another group of young people moving on to make their marks in this world. God, we thank you for being there for us when we call on you. It is your spirit of mercy and grace and patience and strength that carries us in our lifelong faith journey. Thank you for your forgiveness when we mess up and for your love that picks us up to try again. God, I pray that where some will accept that high school graduates fall away from the church, that you would deepen this class's faith, helping them to see that it is no longer mom's faith or dad's faith or grandma's or pastor's or youth leader's faith, it's their own. So thank you for your continued presence in all of our lives, for your protection against the evil one, your discipline and direction, and for the joy that can only come from a growing relationship with you and your son. And to all in worship today, may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Hello, my name is Bridget Griffin. I'm going to the University of Cincinnati to study engineering with an Air Force ROTC scholarship. After college, I will enter the Air Force as a commissioned officer in the military. Please stand as you are able for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. If you would please join me in singing the alma mater.
Thank you. Hello. Uh, my name is Haley Carroll. I have chosen passages which I believe reflect our fears about the tremendous change occurring in our lives and deepens our courage to move forward because while undergoing these changes throughout the next few months, it is important to know that the Lord's love for us will endure, endure forever. The first verse is Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 6 through 8. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ. Finally, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. In the second verses, Joshua chapter 1, verses, verse 9. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mariah Brooks. I want to start by saying, seniors, we did it. We finally crossed the, the finish line. There's some times where I thought to myself, how am I going to make it to graduation? Looking back, it's obvious what got me through these past four years. By what, I really mean who. Throughout these four years, my mom has constantly been there for me. Many of you don't know, but my dad never received a high school diploma. Correction, he didn't even make it to high school before dropping out. My mom was there to help me through everything, whether I was nervous about an upcoming test, having a breakdown about possibly following my father's footsteps, or having a conflict with my friend, my mom was there to reassure and urge me to pull through whatever I was going through. While I couldn't have made it through high school without my mom, I also couldn't have done it without my stepdad, Aaron. Like my mom, he was always there for me to offer advice, pick me up from practice, or tell me a joke because he knew I needed one. I'm so thankful for my parents. With their help, I've had an amazing senior year. Actually, scratch that. I've had an amazing four years at Fairmont, and I couldn't have done it without them. Thank you. Hi, my name's Abigail Snodgrass. God couldn't be everywhere, and so he made grandparents, a quote by Rudyard Kipling. Many of us are very close with our grandparents, and others might not have ever known theirs. In my situation, I've had a very close one with mine. Matter of fact, they helped raise me for five years of my life. I, my, Zach, my brother, and my mom and I moved in when I was just two years old. My brother wasn't even one. Yet, I can remember how excited I was to move in with Grandma and Grandpa. I thought it was so cool to tell my friends that I got to live with my grandparents. Who doesn't want to live with their grandparents? I had my own room, and even better, I got to paint it however I wanted. Pink, of course. For all of us who have had the wonderful fortune to live near our grandparents, or even just a short hour away, we now realize how lucky we are. The endless hugs and kisses, wonderfully prepared home-cooked grandma meals, as I call them, and never going to bed without a bedtime story from grandma were just some of the highlights of my childhood. I will forever remember the hot bike riding lessons with the reward of getting to ride all the way to Dairy Queen. I won't forget sitting on my living room couch after school waiting for my grandpa to come home and kiss my grandma and say, hello, dear, and in my high-pitched voice mimicking his hello, dear, right back. Better yet, I will always cherish the wonderful Hilton Head Island vacations, a place I will clothe, clothe, hold close to my heart forever. But as I got older, the highlights grew to be different. I won't ever forget the selfless acts that my grandparents have done for me, never missing a sporting event or orchestra or school event. Sorry. I can never thank them enough for helping me get to the place I am today. Their endless love and support has made me someone I am so proud of, and I want to thank them for that. So thank you, Grandma and Grandpa, and of course, my step-grandma Cheryl, who has loved me as her own. I also want to thank all the other grandparents for the endless love and support 
that they give their grandchildren. We don't say it every day, but we are so thankful for you. Hi, I'm Emily Galantine. As high school students, we typically go to school five out of seven days of the week for about nine and a half months, going to the same seven classes with the same teachers and classes. If each of us stopped to reflect on our time in high school and teachers we had, I know for a fact we all could pinpoint at least one teacher who has made a difference in our lives. Sorry. In my opinion, a great teacher can truly change a student's life. The best teachers are committed to their students' well-being inside and outside of the classroom. Whatever a student needs to help them excel, a life-changing teacher will be there for them. From needing an extra push to get an A in a class, or just needing somebody to talk to about something going on in their personal life. High school students look to their teachers as mentors with experience and knowledge. Teachers can be a trusted source of advice for students weighing important life decisions. A good teacher tries to see things through the eyes of their students. A great teacher sets high expectations for their students to challenge them to reach for the best. A great teacher who has developed a relationship with their students knows it will be hard to say goodbye at the end of the school year, hoping those students will come back to visit. Hi, I'm Elena Kreider. Who are mentors? Teachers, coaches, parents, and pastors, just to name a few. According to Merriam-Webster Dictionary, a mentor is a trusted counselor or guide. As we have gone on through our schooling, we have all had at least one mentor along the way. Take a moment to think about the one person who you could always go to. The person that was there at your best times, but also there at your worst. Who comes to your mind? Over the course of my schooling, I've had the privilege to meet many wonderful people who I can call mentors. I started freshman year not knowing what to expect or how I was going to fit in, how I was going to make it, but luckily God blessed me with a woman who I had no clue would take me in, love me, encourage me, and always pray for me. This person was my U.S. history teacher, Mrs. King. I met her and instantly felt safe and comfortable. Life was hard, but this teacher was so understanding, empathetic, and caring. Over the course of my four years, I have grown an inseparable bond with Miss King. She was the one who let me hide out in her classroom, talk me through the typical drama, and she was the one who was there when my life was falling apart. Through Miss King, I have found a new hope for the world, a new love for people, and a growing love for life. She has shown me how to truly live to the fullest. Over the course of my high school career, I have grown so close to the Lord because of her. No matter what I did or how I felt, Miss King would take the time to love me, encourage me, and encourage me. I have grown so much because of her, and I am, for that I am so blessed. I was also lucky enough to have a few teachers who were other mentors, but I was also blessed with a few mentors from church. This past year has been so hard for me. My family fell apart, I lost myself, and I fell from God. I started my job at the Beaver Creek Christian Learning Center, and through that, I was drawn into the Beaver Creek Church of the Nazarene. I felt the Lord calling me, and I am so thankful that I followed him. Over a few months, I slowly started getting involved in this new church. I hate change, and there has already been so much change, so I was really timid on taking the leap. However, I followed the Lord, and I did, and it was the best decision I have ever made. I joined a small group, and the amount of love and support I receive is incredible. Every single person in my group mentors me in a different way, but all in positive ways that will better me. I have a new family with this group, and whether I need life advice, spiritual advice, or I just want to have a game night, these people are always there. I feel so loved, and I am so thankful to have these mentors as I take another big leap and start college. Thank your mentors and cling to them as you move forward. Remember the life advice they have given to you, the amount of love, encouragement, and hope that has been poured into you. The best thing you can do is take what you've received and pay it forward. Although change is hard and really scary, we have a God that we can turn to who will guide us all. God says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope in a future. Jeremiah 29, 11. Thank you. Hello, I am Peter Conley, and I'm talking about directors. They are definitely, truly something special and a rare breed. They can be the one reason you wake up in the morning to go to school and just have a smile on your face. I personally have learned this lesson having symphony orchestra first period this year. Has been an, it has been an absolute joy starting my morning with one of these with one of the most, if not the most, kind man in the world, Mr. Wright. In the, seven notes of, in the seven years of knowing him as my orchestra teacher, I have never even once seen him get angry with a student about behavior, although 
He has joked around losing it and going off on a student just to see what they'd say. <laughs> he, however, has not had the reason to because of the attitude we all have about music. Regardless of the type of music, the type of student you are outside the music room, we all have the willingness to put forth our best effort every day. It has been enjoyable to take a break from the typical schoolwork and increase the gray matter in our brain while challenging us with music. This, is then, this then is what makes directors truly special. They can turn a concophony into a symphony, all while making our brains smarter for the day ahead. Thank you, congratulations. Hi, my name is Harper Justice, and I'll be speaking about friends. Having made it through high school, I can confidently say one thing. This was really hard. There's not enough sleep, you hate your job, there's never enough time to write your stupid extended essay. So of course, every time you forget a book at home, don't turn in an assignment, or just say something really, really stupid in front of a teacher, it all seems that much harder. And oftentimes, it's much easier to turn not to the families that you live with, but rather the ones that you've built over your years at school. Here's to the people in advisory that give you, that give you their jacket so you wouldn't break dress code and have Mr. White call you out. To that girl who sat by you in English class and not only let you borrow a pen, but maybe even hand you a fun color. To the kid who, you, who gave you rides when you had a flat tire, and to that one guy who you would always give rides to. To every person who had the answer to, hey, was their homework last, last night, when, when you would text them at midnight. To all of your friends that held you up and kept you sane through everything, without each other, this all would have been impossible. In a time where so much is constantly changing, it's nice to have people that you know will have your back. Our relationships with these kind of people and these families are ones that we, we will be building for the rest of our lives. There will always be people reminiscent of the ones we went to school with, the coworkers you can trade shifts with, or some barista that remembers your order. These are the people who are never thanked enough and who maybe deserve to be thanked the most. Yeah. Of course, I could thank all of our teachers, but I won't. And I'm not going to because they already know what we have to say. Even after they finished their own high school careers, they've been overseeing and observing so much of our own experiences. All of our teachers, advise, advisors, coaches, and directors have been there right alongside thousands of students just like us, so I'd like to think that by now they understand how much they all mean to us. So here's to us. Every classmate, class member, castmate, lab partner, and bus buddy, thank you so much. We couldn't have done it without you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Madeline Dooley Rhodes, and I'm giving a speech about coaches. August 24th, 2017, Alter. This is the night everything changed for Fairmont. The journey Coach Miller took us on was the beginning of a shift, not only affecting athletics, but Fairmont as a whole. The love and compassion he has shown his players has kickstarted a change in the culture. Attitude and effort has been implanted in our everyday lives. Many student athletes and coaches have fed off the energy created at the beginning of the year. Coaches such as Coach Baxter, Albright, Baker, and Hennessy, just to name a few, have been founders of a new light Fairmont has never seen before. Faith, hope, and redemption have been restored for the culture. The class of 2018 has faced many hardships, but it's the coaches and the culture that, around us that keep us sane. In James chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible states, perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and, and complete, not lacking anything. The concept of perseverance is ingrained in each one of us because of what we are taught not only in school, but the field, court, or track. Not only do our coaches teach us skills about the sport we are pursuing, but life skills that are essential to our success. Lessons are taught not only through your words, but through your actions as well, and for that, we thank you. Thank you for displaying perseverance and grit in your own lives, whether it is life-threatening or very minor, and encouraging us to follow in your footsteps. I believe, as a member of the class of 2018, that we have left our mark on Fairmont High School and its athletics, but we thank you, our coaches, for leaving a mark on us. Thank you. Hi, I'm Mackenzie. Um, I'm actually talking about friends. Um, through my four years at Fairmont, I've been through a lot, um, as has this class. 
Perseverance is the exact word that I would describe this graduating class. We don't lack unity nor strength, and our lasting friendships is what has shaped us into the people that we are today. The diverse population at Fairmont has given me opportunities to see situations from all points of view. Fairmont has given me so many opportunities, like this one, and I'm so thankful for the people that I get to stand right beside while tackling these challenging four years. While high school seems like such a small portion of an entire life ahead of us, it is during these four years that people like myself find who they aspire to be. A friend should compel you to do better, to be better. The people of this class truly do fit all those requirements. With graduation less than a week away, seniors have been preparing to move on. No matter what life holds for my peers and me, I am happy to say that I will not forget the genuine friends I have met along the way. Friends give you a piece of themselves, something that you're able to carry on for the rest of your life. Drive, integrity, passion, and will are just a few qualities that my friends inspire me to captivate every day. Finally, I want to say thank you to every friend or classmate who has affected me throughout these four years. I truly would not be the person I am today without the encouragement and strength of my own friends. As I wrap it up, I hope that we can all appreciate the friends in our lives who push us continually, who strive for us to be the best version of ourselves, and pray that we abide in these qualities for years to come. Ah, hello, my name is Brian Hoffman. I will be making my speech about media, and the life lessons that can, can be taken from it. As we sit here today, we are sharing in a collective moment of reflection. It is one of many that life will have to offer to us. We can make use of these moments if we are willing to listen in on them and others as implements in our lives so that we might be successful in our careers and or motivations. Before now, we have taken in the life lessons of our family, friends, and neighbors. It is those people who are sitting here with us now as we are dressed in our caps and gowns who we may recall as having learned our life lessons together with, which is undeniably something meaningful and worthwhile. And yet, there are still other media that we may have also found useful learning from in order to better ourselves. I, like others in, the, in this audience, have found some of these mediums within digital media. Another powerful medium in making life lessons accessible and easily palpable is comedy. Comedy numbs our reception of difficult subject matter and makes it something we all can share in and learn from without the societal angst and predisposition from our peers. When comedy and media combine, we create the single best medium to create, share stories, and life lessons with each other. One example of this kind of medium I found to be is The Office. The Office is a show, a comedy show, that starts comedian Stephen Carell as Michael Scott, the eccentric boss of the Scranton branch of the fictional Dunder Mifflin Paper Company. The show's premise was that Michael often found himself and obscene and or outlandish exploits that often came at the expense of his co-worker's sanity. Although this was true, we, the audience, could not help but laugh and appreciate Michael's antics as they came from a person who genuinely cared for almost everyone under his employ. As to the show, one life lesson I value from the office is that patience is time worth spent. Jim Halpert and Pam Beasley are two office pals at the start of the series, but by the end of the series, become a couple. They circled each other's relationships until they finally ended up together, but it was difficult for both of them to emotionally deal with missing their opportunities to be together. However, determination and the true love they shared prevailed given time. Similarly, I myself had the patience and commitment to drop my 400 meter dash personal record down 12 seconds given one season of track and field 
despite there being several moments I felt dismayed and downtrodden due to my slow improvement at the start. Another life lesson from the office I will make mention of is respect. It is essential to have a necessary amount of respect for one's, uh, for one's peers in order to work effectively towards a common goal. Michael rep respects most of his office employees for this reason and more, hoping they do the same. As Michael would say, would I rather be, be feared or loved? Easy, both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. Easy, uh, I want, I personally found that my life became significantly easier when I had treated others with respect. Having once managed to code an entire website when given only four weeks with little know-how because of my classmates' genuine desire to help me out for how I treated them. One takeaway from the office that I will, one final takeaway from the office that I will mention is humility. Michael's employees are no stranger to his humor, but they do not often notice his humility. It is an effective and ethical tool for him to rebound from the tough situations he finds himself getting into. For instance, Michael found himself once hitting one of his employees with his car in the parking lot. In true Michael fashion, he candidly admitted to the audience, I have flaws, what are they? I say in the shower, sometimes I spend too much time volunteering, occasionally I'll hit somebody with my car. I, for one, know what humility is and have applied it to my life. As I once damaged a school instrument and had to admit it, uh, admit it was an accident to my school's band director. My honesty and integrity of character in that situation meant so deeply to him that he forgave me and discharged me from receiving any school fines. To finish, it is evident that Michael, such as, uh, is, it is evident that my media, such as the office, is effective when it can handle serious material, like patience, respect, and humility. In a genuinely comical fashion, it is just one example and the myriad pool of mediums where we can find life lessons to apply in order to succeed in our endeavors. Some of the lessons I, have, I came across here came from such an unconventional man. Amazingly, we may find ourselves met with our own Michael Scott in our lives someday. To that, I say, take what you know and listen to him well, as he has much to say, and some of it may be child appropriate. My name is Caitlin Mullenkamp. The motto for Kettering City Schools is good schools, good community. This is one saying that I see daily with my own eyes, as many of you do too. There is a plethora of examples that I can name to display how this motto is shown throughout Kettering, but there is one specific event that I would like to share. Just a few months ago, I was visiting my future college to get a better feel for the campus, and I was talking to some of the other students who will be attending the college next year as well. Part of the event that I was participating in was getting to know some of the other students who I would be spending the next chapter of my life with. One of the group activities that we had to do was to go around and say something that you helped accomplish within your community. Everyone was saying really great and influential things like cleaning up their roads and parks or helping their elders. When it got to my turn, I shared the fact that my school and my community raised almost $100,000 for charity in just a few months. I had never really become aware to how huge of a deal that was until I had seen the faces of those around me when they heard what I said. They were in shock and disbelief. Because I have grown up in this amazing school district and community, it was almost as if I hadn't known anything other than raising that kind of money and showing that kind of support. Although this event may seem small, it opened my eyes to just how amazing our school district and community is. I am grateful to have been raised in such a strong and supportive place. To my fellow graduates, the life skills this community has shown and taught us will take us all to great places in our lives. This community is one we should be proud to be a part of, and one that we should cherish in our hearts. No matter how far we travel, how many places we see, how many miles we go, or how long we are gone, we can always call ourselves Firebirds and know that Kettering will always be our home. Thank you.
Hello. <laughs> Hello, Fairmont Class of 2018, parents and teachers. My name is tonight Sorfino. Four years ago, we started high school as freshmen, or as the upperclassmen like to call us, fresh meat. <laughs> Today, we come here as seniors as well as alumni of Fairmont High School. Today is the day to remember our time in high school, the endless nights of coffee, espresso, and Starbucks. Our days spent writing, typing, and finessing our way through senior year, as well as our, as well as our countless victories over senioritis. Now is the time to truly reflect and reminisce about our accomplishments as students, daughters, and sons. We finally made it. Great job. <laughs> this coming Saturday, we will be graduating. For many of us, Saturday will mark the beginning of new challenges as we head out to tackle the world of college, independence, and freedom on our own. For, for many of you, this may be your chance to take, a, to take a gap year and explore what this world may offer. Whatever it is that you plan to do, remember the sacrifices you've, you've made to, sorry, remember the sacrifices you've made to, make, to be here today. Remember that you were lucky to be able to make such sacrifices, while many others in this world were unfortunately unable to do so. Remember that there was once a boy named Ronnie Bauer, who according to many had an amazingly kind heart, a genuinely kind spirit, an enthusiasm that could brighten up even the darkest room, and a dream lit a dream like many of ours worth achieving and living. Remember Ronnie Bowers, not for the limitless possibilities that were stripped away from him as a result of senseless violence, but as a boy who had the warmth of an angel, as one who could make anyone smile, and as a fellow classmate. I would now like to take a moment of silence to remember Ronnie as a student, a son, a brother, and a fellow classmate. As the flame of this candle lights up every corner of this room, let us take a moment to remember those that were not given the opportunity to be here today. Let us also take a moment to remember the struggles, achievements, and whirlwind, whirlwind of the last four years of high school. Let us remember the people in our lives that are like this candle, and let's strive to be a symbol of this light to others. Thank you. I wish you all the best in finding your light, as well as becoming that light for someone else.
Hello, my name is Theodore Hale. I have been accepted into the Sinclair uh, in, in Correction Science and Noble Arts program. It is my honor to introduce our guest speaker, Sergeant Kurt Holden, with the Wright State University Police Department. Sergeant Holden received an Associate of Science to, uh, in Criminal Justice and Law Enforcement from Sinclair Community College and a Bachelor's and Master's degree from Wright State University. He is a field training officer and supervisor, works on the bike patrol, serves on the canine and crime prevention units, and has taught criminal justice classes. Yet, in, his, in addition to his busy schedule, Kurt finds time to coach and, and mentor em, emancipated foster youth at the university. Mentoring is close to Sergeant Holden's heart because he grew up in foster care. Determined to, to overcome his difficult, difficult childhood, he focused on his education and developed programs to help former foster children succeed in college. He is sharing his program with other colleges and groups. Kurt never misses a chance to help others. While off duty, he helped save the citizen's life who had gone into cardiac arrest. For this, he earned the Distinguished Law Enforcement Service Award from the Ohio Attorney General. Other awards include the Diversity Advocate Award, Blue Coat Officer of the Year, the, the Wright State University President's Award for, for Excellence in Leadership, and many other condemnations from the Ohio House of Representatives, the Ohio Senate, and the United States Secret Service. Please welcome our guest speaker, Kurt Holden. Thank you. I'm more impressed with you all today. He put a lot up on my resume out there, didn't he? So I want to first just say thank you um, for inviting me to come speak with you all. Um, when I got the call from Nancy Clark, I was just like, absolutely, I'll come and talk. Uh, that sounds exciting. And I love to talk to young students going into, of course, college, because that's something that I struggled with. And I'll, and I'll kind of share that here in a few. I also want to say, parents, um, what you're feeling right now, I don't know yet. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and the joy and the um, kind of sadness picturing your little baby, and now you see him all adult and going to college, you're probably like in this weird mood, so try to not cry today, right? And to the students, you all work extremely, extremely hard. Um, you deserve everything that you have coming your way. Um, you all have accomplished a lot. I have heard all the speakers. Um, you all are going to UC, um, corrections division, military, colleges. I mean, you all have done a tremendous job. With that said, yes, I'm a cop, so you have the, rem so you have the right to, to get excited today, all right? <laughs> all right? With that said, I just wanted to share that a lot of people say cops got the best stories. And we do have the best stories. Firefighters are like a distant second. That's the joke, right? <laughs> and so I want to share a story with you about a mom and a dad, okay? And the mom is getting their two kids, and she's loading them up in the van, and she's buckling them up in their booster seats, and dad is going through the checklist, and he's just sitting there going, okay, I got this luggage, I got this suitcase, I got this, I got this, I got this. And the kids are sitting there kind of nervous because they're like, when is mom and dad going to argue, right? Because we all have been there when mom and dad are getting ready for trips. And so dad gets everything loaded up, mom gets in the um, passenger seat, dad gets in the car, and they start driving on their trip. And they're driving and driving and driving and driving, and they're so excited, they're singing songs, the kids are laughing, goofing off. And a few hours into this trip, he stops and he looks up and he sees a rest stop and he thinks to himself, should I stop? And he realizes, he's like, I'm really making fantastic time, there's no way I'm stopping, we're getting there. So he keeps driving and driving and driving and a few hours go by and um, the excitement's kind of went down and he looks in a rearview mirror and the kids are watching DVD now and he looks over at mom and she's playing Candy Crush on her iPhone. And he looks up and he sees another rest stop and he's just like, we've been on the road for a little bit. Should I stop? But he looks at the time and he says, I'm making record time. Absolutely not. I'm getting there. 
So he drives and drives and drives. And a couple hours later, looks in the rearview mirror, and now his kids are fast asleep. He looks over at his wife, and she's now yawning, kind of staring out the window. And he sees another rest stop, and he thinks, should I stop? Should I stop? And then what happens is he just says, nah, I'm good. Keeps driving. Drives and drives and drives. And next thing you know, he hears a piercing scream. He looks in the rearview mirror and his kids are crying. And he looks over and his wife is pulling the steering wheel onto the, onto the right side of the roadway. At this point in time, he realized he just fell asleep at the wheel. I had a mom and dad that fell asleep at the wheel in my life. They chose drugs and alcohol and other vices instead of raising me and my three brothers. And so now that you kind of understand a little bit about why I went into foster care, I want to take you back to the beginning. See, it all began April 12, 1989. I was two and a half years old. At two and a half years old, I was put into the foster care system. This is where I lived. Doesn't look like much. Busted windows, broken doors, and now a broken home. And a lot of you are like, what in the world? And the thing is, is that that's where it all started, and to me, I called that home. And so when we were put in a foster care, all my brothers and me were all split up. We were all put in different foster homes, okay? And we were placed in foster homes because my father was a criminal and a drug addict. My mom was an alcoholic, and they were in no position to care for us. And many, many times I was very upset with that. I always ask God, why? Why, God? Like, why, 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 why have I not got my mom and dad, and why don't I have my brothers? You're God. Why I was in care, I went to school. Many kids in school, because they were younger, they didn't understand. They was like, where's your mom and dad at, Kurt? I'm like, oh, they're at home. You know how you just say what you need to say to blend in. And the thing is, they put labels on me. You know, they would say, Kurt, you're an orphan. Kurt, you're a foster kid. Kurt, you're this, you're this, and this. And even the foster parents began to say, hey, this is my son, this is my daughter, and this is our orphan, Kurt. I'm like, hey, I'm Kurt the orphan. How you doing? All right? <laughs> so that, because you got to just own it, right? And so what happened was my caseworkers and parents at time would then begin to label me as well. So I was labeled as an orphan. I was labeled as, as, you know, a kid that was just left alone. I was labeled as depressed and angry and everything that they could try to put on me to try to help fix a kid. You try to understand, so you try to put a label to it. And those labels continued in a junior high and high school. They continued. Um, and foster kid, orphan couch surfer. Those are some of the bad ones. But then also varsity basketball, homecoming court. I was the man in high school. Yes. <laughs> right? So like I was labeled good things and bad things. But at the end of the day, I was forced to identify with all these labels that everyone else put on me. And I was like, that's not who I am. And so when you're told by parents and foster parents and caseworkers that, hey, Kurt, what are you going to do with your life? Oh, I want to go to college. And then they're like, well, you know, only 2 to 4% of foster kids go on to achieve a college degree. Thanks for that information. <laughs> I'm really encouraged by this pep talk. And I'm like, okay, well, if that don't work out, I guess military or something. They're like, well, you know, uh, most kids whose parents were addicts turn into addicts. Wow. Thank you for encouraging me. <laughs> like, and these are things that I grew up with. And I was just like, absolutely. This is absolutely insane. And so whenever you're told that, you sit there and you begin to think, 
Wow. Wow. All the things that's happened. So in all the storms and all the turmoil from, of course, changing from home to home and not knowing where I was going to lay my head down at night, because I bounced around to different foster homes a lot. And, of course, a lot of people go, well, why'd you bounce around so much? Well, my goal was to try to eventually force them to force me and my brothers back together. And so when I began to struggle, I went to church. And there I actually found God. And at that point in time, that's the label I wanted. I wanted to be a man of God. I wanted to be directed and ordered by him. And in my first part of that relationship, I became very angry. Because when you begin to understand how awesome God is and how powerful God is and how perfect he is, you begin to question all the imperfections that are going on in your life. And so I used God like he was like, like a trash disposal. I'd be like, hey, God, here's something else happening to me. What's up, man? Are we really going to do this again? And then, of course, you know, I began to understand that that's not true faith. True faith is not really telling God about your problems. It's about telling your problems about your God. Okay, that's true faith. Everybody can come here and pour everything onto God, but when you got something going on and you say, I don't think you know how awesome my God is. I don't think you understand how powerful he is. This is just a test, and you can't have a testimony without going through a test. And that's the way I began to understand it. And so I regained a, a renewed look in life. I became mission-driven. I graduated high school, like you all. You know, and when I graduated high school, I was so scared because when, whenever you're a foster kid and you graduate from high school, they're like, congratulations, here's a cashier's check for $500, good luck in life. And I'm like, no, what am I to do? So I got scared. And, but again, I just sat there and I said, you know what? God is awesome. God has this. So I packed up all my belongings and I went to Wright State University. And I put all my belongings in a trash bag because I didn't have a suitcase. And so I'm that kid at college walking around the trash bag. What's up? How you doing? I'm here for college too, just so you know. And they're like, well, no, you're not. <laughs> and the thing is, is that, is that people were looking at me kind of crazy. They were like, this guy is crazy. He has a trash bag. Who brings a trash bag to college? And I said, the orphan, Kurt, right here, this guy. And so the problem is, is that I really wasn't at college for education. See, I needed a place to live, and Wright State had dormitories. And so I went there, and I said to myself, if I can get into a room and board, I can do this. I can, I can do this. And so, so what I did was what no normal person does in college, okay? I went to college to strictly live in the dormitory. And I worked at every job around campus until I flunked out with a 1.0 GPA. And you're all thinking, what was the point of going to college? And the thing is, is that I wanted to go to college. But when I was informed that my younger brother, Chris, was about to be emancipated as well and end up homeless, I realized that I needed to just save up and get us a place to live. And so I saved up and I got us a place to live. And for the first time in 19 years, I brought in my younger brother and me and him had our own place. And after a while, things were great, things were good. And I said to myself, okay, what am I gonna do? I'm going back to college. <laughs> and all you're thinking, 1.0 GPA, not gonna work out for you. And I'm sure all the foster moms and caseworkers and things were saying, two to 4% graduate, two to 4%. But the problem is, is that I didn't go to college to learn. I went to college to live. And so I went back to Sinclair Community College and there I graduated on the honor roll, high GPA, went through the police academy, graduated top of my class. And then I found a job at Wright State University as a police officer. Then I started a, I um, helped start a foster care program so other kids that are going to college don't have to do what I did. They don't have to have that. 
And so I helped develop that program. I went on to receive my uh, bachelor's degree and went on to receive my, my um, master's degree as well. And after I received my master's degree, someone came up to me and said, hey, do you want to teach criminal justice? I'm like, oh, what in the world? This guy teaching criminal justice? This guy? The orphan? This guy? And they're like, yeah, you, you. I'm like, okay, yeah, sure, sure. And I don't tell you all this to say, wow, look at my life. I tell you that because I want you to understand that you all are going to go through something in college. You all are going to have certain things that you go through. And if, of course, you can just look at God, follow him, let him order your steps, whatever it is, work hard in everything that you do. Okay, there is something within us that this world needs to see. Okay, and, I'll, and of course, a lot of times we get a little ashamed of that. We can't speak about that from a podium. We can't speak about those things. But today, I am going to say God, 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 as much as I can, because he deserves all the credit. Okay? So I learned to stay God-focused, God-centered, and God-missioned. And in that relationship, I realized all the labels that were attached to me have now kind of fell off. And now I had a label of a man of God, which is what I wanted. That is what I wanted. And so wherever he ordered my steps is where I would go. And so now I want to show you just how great God is. Remember, I had three brothers. And I want to show you just them. So there's my three brothers. There's us. That was our picture when we were together, right before we were separated. And then that's now us back. They run a successful company, uh, very, very, very well off now. They are doing really, really well. And now I want to show you how a couple of us went to a full family. So now you see that little old me from a broken home, broken windows, busted doors, by keeping God center in my life and keeping God focused, that at the end of the day, he can make anything possible. The next slide is of my wife and my two kids. And I show you this picture because I want you to understand that God has a very unique way of showing just how awesome he is. Try not to get emotional, try not to. But growing up without a mother and being blessed by God to have the greatest mother for my children is something that only he can do, only he can shape out and make possible. And having the opportunity to where I, to where I didn't have a father and giving me the blessing to be able to father to my crazy six-year-old boy, he is insane, and my two-year-old little girl. So now you see what God is capable of with a kid from nothing. Statistics say he shouldn't be where he is. Statistics say I shouldn't have graduated from college. Statistics say I should have been a drug addict. Statistics say I should have been in jail. And I completely did the complete opposite. And that's because of God. And so as you enter into this next chapter, I want to challenge you. I want you to stay God-centered and God-focused. I work at a college. I know things. <laughs> stay prayed up. Okay? Go there with a mission to accomplish what you've always dreamed of. You will get labeled. You probably have labels now. You got labels of honor roll, labels of basketball player, football player, but in college you're going to have labels of clubs you join, fraternities, sororities, right? Other organizations, you're going to have all these labels. And they're fun to have, but don't let those labels define who you are as a person. 
Don't get so wrapped up in that label that you forget who all point matters at the end of the day, and that's him. And so you will face tough times. But please stay God-focused, spirit-driven. And at the end of the day, you've got to have fun. You've got to have fun at college. It is one of the best experiences you'll ever have. Do you think high school was fun? College is really cool. <laughs> but it comes with a lot more responsibility, okay? So I just want to say I wish each of you nothing but the best. And seriously, congratulations. You all deserve everything that's coming your way. That's great. Thank you so much. Please bow your head for the prayer. God of truth and knowledge, by your wisdom we are taught the way and the truth. Bless us as we now finish this course of study. We thank you for those who taught and worked beside us and all who supported us along the way. Walk with us as we leave our high school life and move forward on the path of life's journey. Strengthen our many talents and skills and instill in us a confidence in the future you plan where we may work for the good of all people. Amen. Good evening. How are you guys doing today? Feeling good? We are a week away from your graduation ceremony, and that is awesome. The past four years of high school, you've been chasing success at every corner earning a perfect GPA, acing that test, excelling in various sports and musical activities, king or queen at a dance, or getting the lead in the play. Even with great success, I'd venture to believe that you may have still felt like you were missing something. One of the greatest basketball players and front office executives in the history of the NBA has even felt that way. Jerry West played numerous seasons and set multiple records as a player. As a front office executive, he built championship teams with the Lakers, pairing Kobe Bryant and Shaquille O'Neal together, and helped build the foundation of the current Golden State Warriors. I know Cavs fans, that's hard. The NBA logo is also Jerry West likeness. He's had a lot of success. And he was asked a few years ago if he felt that he had attained everything he wanted in his life. And this was his answer. From that standpoint, I don't have everything. Self-esteem is something I still battle. People look at me and say that you've got fame, you've got admiration, you've done this, you've done that. And I look at me and say, as far as I'm concerned, I haven't done anything. I've just fulfilled a dream of competing. I could be special in some ways, even though I felt at times, my goodness, you're among the upper echelon. There is still a huge void there, a huge void. Over the next four plus years, you will continue to compete and you will continue to succeed at higher levels than you've ever experienced. But even with great success, I'm sure that there will still be an empty feeling in the back of your mind. It's natural to long for what's next. But I challenge you to think bigger, to dream bigger, and ponder what can really fill that void. A noted philosopher, Blaise Pascal, even states that we have a God-shaped hole inside of our hearts that only he himself can fill. Yet we constantly turn to other things in life to fill that void, hoping that it will fill it long enough that we can search for what's next, but it never lasts. And we're all here today because of God, because of God in our lives. And I challenge you, if you have felt that void, to dig deep and seek God out and ask Him how He can fill that empty feeling. 
At this time, please join with me as we pray. God, thank you for these past four years, for molding these students into the young men and young women that they've become. We thank you for the countless people that you have placed in their lives, parents, family, teachers, administrators, coaches, and mentors. We pray that these students will not forget these years, but we also pray that they will not dwell on them or live in them. We ask that you continue to provide direction and guidance as they move forward onto new endeavors and challenges. Amen. On behalf of the parent committee, we would like to thank you for joining us this evening in celebration of the class of 2018. Give it up for yourselves. It's great. And we'd also like to invite you to help make baccalaureate possible for the class of 2019 by making a donation to help offset the cost that general happens with baccalaureate each year. Upon conclusion of the evening, please allow the graduates to exit completely before making your way to the lobby. There's also a photo booth out there for your enjoyment to celebrate with the graduates. At this time, we'd like to welcome Aaron Zaruga to lead the student affirmation to close our evening together. Hello, my name is Aaron Zaruga, and I will be leading the students in the student affirmation. All graduates, please stand and read together. We believe in God, creator of the world and all people. We rejoice in every sign of God's kingdom, in each upholding of human dignity and community, in each act of self-giving on behalf of others, in the abundance of God's gifts entrusted to us that all may have enough. In all responsible use of the Earth's resources, we commit ourselves individually and as graduates to seek abundant life for all humanity, to struggle for peace with justice and freedom, praying that God's kingdom may come. Amen. <laughs> 